Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends and colleagues. My name is Juliane Kempfield. I'm the director here at Deutsches Haus. It is my great pleasure to welcome you to an event which I've been looking forward to ever since we knew that uh, Yoko Tawada was going to be our next DAD Poetics Chair. I shouldn't say our, the German department's DAD Poetics <laughs> Chair. I'm taking over. No, I'm just kidding. Um, but seriously, I, I was so thrilled and I'm so happy she's here tonight and of course uh, also very, very happy that uh, distinguished author Rivka Galchen is here to speak with her tonight um, about magnificent strangeness and uh, other exciting topics. Um, prior to the conversation, however, I would like to thank a bunch of people and institutions. First of all, Elise George, assistant professor in the Department of German and our other wonderful colleagues across the street, uh, and especially a big thank you to Eckhard Goebel, who was crucial for making this event happen. You, you guys are wonderful and always a pleasure to work with. I'm, I'm thrilled about the collaborations between Deutsches Haus and the German department. Um, I would like to thank the DAAD, the German Academic Exchange Service, for their long-standing and generous support of our academic programs. They have been amazing in enabling us to do programs. Uh, and I especially would like to thank Nina Lemons, Katarina Narbutovic, and Michael Tomanek. I would also like to thank New Directions for selling books by our wonderful authors here tonight. I'd also like to thank my colleagues, uh, our interns and student workers for their hard work in making all our events happen. And last but not least, you, the audience, for coming to our events and for giving us a chance to do what we enjoy. Uh, grateful for your loyalty and for your interest. Now, last year, we had a wonderful exhibition, and I don't know if you had a chance to see it. It was an exhibition by the Berlin-based photographer Heike Steinweg. Heike came with this fantastic proposal of uh, portraying authors um, and uh, having them speak about a last line in one of their books. And when she put together the exhibition, we weren't quite sure who the authors would be. So when she arrived with a suitcase full of wonderful portraits, she took them out, she showed us, and she was very excited, and she would say, oh, look at this photo, look at this photo, and suddenly she took out this photo of Yoko Tawada, and I was like, oh my god, you know, she'll be our, not our, their, their <laughs> day, <laughs> sorry, their day poetics chair, and, and so in other words, um, Yoko Tawada, you were already here last year, and you spent weeks with us without knowing, and we got used to you, and so we are very thrilled to finally have you here in person, and we hope you'll have a great stay during your time in New York, and uh, we're very, very thrilled. And now, please join me in welcoming Elise George, who will properly introduce our wonderful panelists. Thank you. Thank you so much, Juliana, for the kind introduction. And I want to also thank Sarah Girna, who was pivotal in making this event possible tonight. I won't repeat the thanks in detail, but my colleagues in the German department have been just wonderful in their support of this Poetics Chair program. And of course, it wouldn't be possible at all without the DAD who funds it. Um, one more remark, just that it's the great joy, one of the great joys of my job teaching in the German department that I get to invite my literary heroes um, from Germany. And so Yoko's presence here tonight certainly reflects that. And tonight I'm even more delighted because I get to invite one of my American literary heroes, Rivka Galchen, um, and in conversation with, with Yoko. Um, Yoko Tawara was born in Tokyo and moved to Hamburg in 1982. She received her PhD in German literature there and has lived in Berlin now since 2006. She writes in Japanese and German and has published numerous books in various genres, stories, novels, poems, plays, and essays in both languages. She has received many awards for her writing, including the 
Akutagawa Prize, I hope I didn't butcher that, <laughs> uh, the Adelbert von Chamiso Prize, which is a German award that recognizes foreign writers for their contributions to German culture, the Tanizaki Prize, the Goethe Medal, which is an official decoration of the Federal Republic of Germany, and the prestigious Yomiuri Prize for Literature in Japan. New Directions has published Tawada's short, short story collections, Facing the Bridge and Where Europe Begins, gorgeously translated by Susan Bernofsky, who I see in the audience tonight, um, and with a preface by the director, Wim Wenders, as well as her novel, The Naked Eye, and a story, The Bridegroom Was a Dog. Her most recent novel, Etudes im Schnee, I believe is being translated by Susan as we speak, so look for it in your local bookshop soon. Yoko Tawada has been a writer in residence at the Villa Aurora, MIT, Stanford, Cornell, Washington University, and St. Louis, to name just a few, and of course here at our very own Deutsches Haus in 2004. So we welcome her back tonight. Tawada's often uncanny works have won a devoted following for their creative use of linguistic play and their undermining of conventional linguistic meaning. Her texts resist easy interpretation and command us to encounter them on their own terms. In an interview from 2008, she remarked that, quote, all interesting literature is born in that moment when you are not sure if you are in one place with one culture, end quote. We might extend that to say that Yoko Tawada's literary interest is peaked at moments of disjuncture, not only between cultures, but also between languages, modes of perception, and personal encounters, both with others and with oneself. The object world, in which traces of, the, of past presence are keenly felt, form another focal point. Things, objects, have their own life stories, and her texts conduct, conduct archaeological digs to uncover their hidden pasts. The New York Times wrote that Tawada's writing, quote, agitates the mind like songs half remembered or treasure boxes whose keys are locked within, end quote. And I think that that really gives a feeling for, for the type of expression that's so unique to Yoko Tawada's writing. Another unique author is Rivka Galchin. Whether she's writing in The New Yorker about medicine, science, dance, or my favorite personal piece, um, The German's Bizarre Fascination with Karl May Wild West Spectacles, <laughs> as you can read, <laughs> or whether she's wondering of Kafka, quote, what kind of funny is he, as the title of a recent review essay in the London Review of Books asked. Rivka Galchin is among the most stellar voices in contemporary American writing. Her debut novel, Atmospheric Disturbances, was published in 2008 by Farrar, Strauss, and Giroux. It was translated subsequently into over 20 languages and was awarded the William Saroyan International Prize for Writing. Her second book, American Innovations, appeared in 2014, also with FSG, and has been praised by the New York Times, The New Republic, and NPR, to name just a few. Galchen has received a Rona Jaffe Foundation Writer's Award and has more recently been a fiction fellow at the American Academy in Berlin. We were just talking about some of the strange encounters with food and other things that she, <laughs> that she experienced there. And she was also named to the New Yorker's venerable 20 under 40 list in 2010. In a conversation with the writer Nathan Englander, Rivka Galchen remarked, quote, other people hypothesize other writers as an author's main influence, but it's always struck me that a donut shop or a girl band or a fourth grade crush might be far more influential, end quote. <laughs> and it's that type of thinking that inspired tonight's constellation of, the, of two of the most linguistically and conceptually intriguing contemporary writers. The title of a beautiful piece Rivka wrote about Yoko in The New Yorker a couple of years back is Yoko Tawada's Magnificent Strangeness. That magnificent strangeness is, however, common to both of tonight's authors. In her story, A Guest from Where Europe Begins, Tawada's protagonist remarks with a measure of melancholy that she's, quote, been listening to a voice that does not resonate in any body, end quote. What I hope will become clear tonight is how both Yoko Tawada's and Rivka Galchin's magnificent 
and utterly irreplicable voices do indeed resonate, not just with some bodies, but with every body. Please join me in welcoming Rivka Galchen and Yoko Tawada. So, good evening. Good evening. Um, I'd like to read Das Fremde aus der Dose. Canned Foreign. I wrote the text in German and Susan Bernowski translated it into English. Aruhi watashi wa sono machi ni tsuita. Watashi ni wa sono moji ga mie na katta. Machi no hito no me ni wa watashi no kao ga mie na katta. Yome nai moji ga mie nai kao o mitsume kaeshite ita. Es gibt in jeder Stadt eine erstaunlich große Anzahl von Menschen, die nicht lesen können. Einige von ihnen sind noch zu jung dafür. Andere lehnen es ab, die Schriftzeichen zu lernen. Es gibt auch viele Touristen und Arbeiter aus anderen Ländern, die mit anderen Schriftzeichen leben. In ihren Augen erscheint das Bild der Stadt wie verrätselt oder verschreiert. In any city one finds a surprisingly large number of people who cannot read. Some of them are still too young, others simply refuse to learn the letters of the alphabet. Also, there are a good many tourists and workers from other countries who live with a different set of characters altogether. In their eyes, the image of the city seems enigmatic, veiled. I already knew the alphabet when I arrived in Hamburg, but I could gaze at the individual letters for a long time without recognizing the meaning of the word. For example, every day I looked at the same poster beside the bus stop, but never read the name of the product. I know only that on one of the most beautiful of these posters, the letter S appeared seven times. I don't think this letter reminded me of uh, the shape of a snake. Not only the S, but all the other letters as well differed from live snakes in that they lacked both moisture and flesh. I repeated the S sounds in my mouth and noticed that my tongue suddenly tasted odd. I hadn't known a tongue too could taste of something. The woman I met at this bus stop had a name that began with S, Sasha. I knew at once she couldn't read. Whenever she saw me, she gazed at me intently and with interest, but she never attempted to read anything in my face. In those days, I often found that people became uneasy when they couldn't read my face like a text. 海を渡ったらお面になった私の顔鏡の前では脱いでも脱げない首かしげても振り返ってもでも見えないのは自分の顔だけ遠いとこい小計文字のような私の顔私で渡す私船サーシャー complacently accepted all forms of illegibility she didn't want to read things she wanted to observe them in detail she must have been in her mid-fifties. I don't remember what color her hair was. I didn't learn to register hair colors as a child, and so I still can't do this. Sasha often waited at the bus stop to meet her girlfriend. For Sonia, that's what she called her friend, was unable to get out of the bus on her own. Her arms and legs were incapable of working in unison toward a single goal. They couldn't all follow the same directions at, all, at once. Sasha placed Sonia's arms and legs together and called her name a few times as though the name could bring harmony to, their, to her limbs. Sasha and Sonia shared an apartment. Three times a week, someone came to attend to whatever written business there was. Apart from reading and writing, the two of them were able to manage everything they needed to live their lives. A few times, they had me over for coffee. 
There are questions Sasha and Sonia never asked, though I encountered those questions everywhere I went. Mostly they began, is it true that the Japanese, that is, most people wanted to know whether or not something they'd read in a newspaper or magazine was true. I was also often asked questions, beginning, in Japan, do people also... I was never able to answer them. Jeder Versuch, den Unterschied zwischen zwei Kulturen zu beschreiben, misslang mir. Der Unterschied wurde direkt auf meine Haut aufgetragen, wie eine fremde Schrift, die ich zwar spüren, aber nicht lesen konnte. Jeder fremde Klang, jeder fremde Blick und jeder fremde äh, Geschmack wirkten unangenehm auf dem Körper, solange bis der Körper sich veränderte. Every attempt I made to describe the difference between two cultures failed. This difference was painted on my skin like a foreign script which I could feel but not read. The U sound, for example, stabbed too deeply into my ears and the R sounds scratched my throat. Certain expressions even gave me goose flesh. For instance, auf die Nerven gehen, to get on his nerves. Die Nase voll haben, fed up to here, or in die Hose gehen, <laughs> all washed up. Most of the words that came out of my mouth had nothing to do with how I felt. But at the same time, I realized that my native tongue didn't have words for how I felt either. It's just that this never occurred to me until I began to live in a foreign language. Often it sickened me to hear people speak their native tongues fluently. It was as if they were unable to think and feel anything but what their language so readily served up to them. From our bus stop, one could see not only the various billboards, but also the sign for a few restaurants. One of them belongs to a Chinese restaurant called the Golden Dragon. Two Chinese characters shown gold and green. The first character meant gold and the second dragon. I explained once to Sasha as I saw her standing, staring at this sign. Sasha then pointed out that the second character was even shaped something like a real dragon. And in fact, it is possible to see the image of a dragon in this character. Yes. The little box in the upper right hand, co uh, right hand corner might be a dragon's head. And the lines on the light side remind me of a dragon's back. But Sasha knew it wasn't a picture of the dragon, for she asked me whether I too could write it. A few weeks later, Sasha showed me a teacup and said that she'd discovered the dragon symbol on it. Indeed, the cup did bear this sign. Sasha had seen it in a shop and immediately bought it. For the first time in her life, she could read. Then I wanted to teach her some more characters. She will always be illiterate, since she can't read the letters of the alphabet, but now she can read one character and knows that the alphabet isn't the only system of writing in the world. Next to the bus stop, was a small shop in which Sasha sometimes bought Sonia a bar of soap. Sonia loves soap, or rather she loves the packaging it comes in. The packaging was misleading, for the paper on the outside was painted with butterflies, birds, or flowers, even though all it contained was soap. <laughs> Very few products have pictures on the package that aren't immediately connected in some way to their contents. Sonia always unwrapped the soap right away when Sasha gave her some, then unwrapped it again. 
Once the box, the soap came in, bore a phoenix on which the word soap was written in fine print that Sonia, of course, couldn't read. Sonia understood only the picture of the phoenix and the content, soap. Only because there is such a thing as written language, I thought to myself, could they paint a phoenix on the box instead of a piece of soap? <laughs> what else could fix the meaning of its content, that is, the soap, if the letter weren't there? Then there would be the danger that the soap might, in course of time, turn into a phoenix and fly away. Once in the supermarket, I bought a little can that had a Japanese woman painted on the side. Later at home, I opened the can and saw inside it a piece of tuna fish. <laughs> the woman seemed to have changed into a piece of fish during her long voyage. <laughs> These supplies came on a Sunday. I had decided not to read any writing on Sundays. Instead, I observed the people I saw on the street as though they were isolated letters. Sometimes two people sat down next to each other in a cafe and thus briefly formed a word. Then they separated in order to go off and form other words. There must have been a moment in which the combinations of these words formed quite by chance several sentences in which I might have read this foreign city like a text. But I never discovered a single sentence in this letter. Uh, in, in this city, only letters and sometimes a few words that had no direct connection to any cultural content. These words now and then led me to open the wrapping paper on the outside, only to find different the wrapping paper below. Thank you. I'm really honored to be here with Yoko Tawada, whose work I love and I find a very hard time characterizing for people for very wonderful reasons, which is that you just, all your sort of sentences that begin with like, this is like something else, don't have anywhere um, to go. In fact, we were talking uh, beforehand that one of the only writers I, I found a sort of like sentence that makes sense for Yoko's work was the writer Bruno Schultz, who's Polish and bears no sort of autobiographical relationship um, at all. So I wanted to ask you a little bit, I wanted to return to that, but I wanted to ask you a little bit. You write sometimes in Japanese, but often in German, which is not your first language. And, and it's obvious what's difficult about not writing in your first language. And I was wondering what is worthwhile to you about writing outside of your first language? Oh. Mm. Hmm. I think uh, if you write a poem or, or the novel, you must use, in any case, another language. Maybe it's both of them are English to you, but it's another English, right? Yeah? It's, uh, you must discover the second language. So it was just Coincidentally, it, it was German language. I had the opportunity to write in German. It is another language. Um, because we are, I had a feeling that we are, that mother tongue is like a cage and you are arrested in it. The mother tongue <laughs> that you speak, you know, you, <laughs> I mean, you must, you, you can, you cannot see the language from the outside if you don't know another language, and you are in a part of the language, so you don't know really what you are writing <laughs> in the language. So that's, uh, that's why I started um, in uh, German, and, and after several years, I could see the Japanese language, my mother tongue also from the language, mm -hmm. yeah. But do you do you write in the same language that you had as in the childhood, or it's another English? No, I love that, I love that <laughs> idea. <laughs> no, no, but I, I love that idea that even that in order to write, it has to be not your first language, even if it happens to be 
technically yeah. your first language, yeah. Um, yeah. which in my case it is. I'm sort of trapped in English. But I do think, I understand what you're saying in the mm. sense that I think having foreigner parents changed English for me. So it already was like cast in a different light. But there's that wonderful moment in Can Foreigner where she feels kind of pity or sympathy for people living in the German language, trying to express their emotions in German, that instead of that being something that makes it more expressive, that they actually know the language well, it actually limits them. They're kind of trapped in these kind of predestined emotions. But I was curious, when you write a story now, does it, is it coming to you in a specific language? Like, when you read Can Foreigner, which I've only read in Susan Bernofsky's translation into yeah. English, you read it in several different languages. And when you're writing it, is it coming to you in several languages and then you're working it forward? Or how is it coming to you in your, in your head? Um, yes, in this case of the Can Foreign, the story came to me in the German language. And also Talisman, another story in the book. And but funny thing about it, I translated it into Japanese, and then at the reading, when I read the talisman, the story talisman, the audience is laughing all the way. But in Japan, they 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 find the <laughs> story um, very um, um, unheimlich. How do you call it? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> nobody laughed, and they are scared about the story. <laughs> 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 and in the, but it's not always the case that the story comes with one language to me. Sometimes I don't know in which language I can write. For example, the, the uh, Naked Eye, that's all the novel that also Susan Bernowski translated into English from German. But I didn't know if I could, I should write it in Japanese or in German. Both of them were, hmm. So I, I wrote some sentences in Japanese, translated it into German, and continued writing in German, some sentences in German, translated it into Japanese, and back and forth. And then I... Um, read the Japanese version, it was not good, so I, cor I, <laughs> I corrected it and then and changed the German version and read the German version, it was not good, so I changed it and so... French? Yes, yeah. French is the best, but yeah, yes, I, I, and after that uh, uh, the French translation is, and the English translation is also very good, but not the both of the originals. So, <laughs> so maybe that's a uh, seeking, I'm looking for uh, the language that does not exist. You know, it's not Japanese, it's not German, but because uh, both of German languages are far away, is there a big space between German and Japanese languages. So I play in, on this place and looking for the language that does not exist. <laughs> You know, and it's not just language often that yeah. is strange. It's, it's, a, it's a cultural practice which you often don't notice. For example, you'll have in your story, you'll say, in this country they had this unusual practice that doctors wanted to speak with you behind closed doors. Um, and, and, and so many things that seem normal will seem suddenly foreign. Did you ever worry that you finally kind of lived in Germany too long and that it would <laughs> stop being a strange place for you? Yeah, yeah, that's why I came to New York. <laughs> <laughs> I find strange things here. And that's <laughs> right, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I also think you've kind of, um, I don't think it's like a conscious program, but you've possibly designed the most difficult stories ever to translate. Because they seem again and again to hinge on a phrase that is read literally or kind of quote unquote misread or, or misunderstood or an association that only makes sense if you have a deep sense of the word, um, although your stories have been beautifully translated. Mm -hmm. um, but are you ever sort of conscious while you're writing a story that it, it, you found the only language it can be told in and then it, it somehow has to find its way into another language? Or, I mean, how conscious yeah. are you? Yeah. 
But I don't think that one text has a certain one meaning or interpretation. It's a text is open. So if the text motivates some translator to, to transport it into another language, it has a strong life. It's a, you know, the next generation of the text. I love translations. And it's not, I can't say, oh, it's not in this meaning. I don't, I didn't mean it, or it's not what my intention, I have no, no, yeah, I, I have no intention, you know, <laughs> that the text is open, it's, the text is a, I don't know, like a life for me, it must live um, longer, and uh, the te some texts need, really need translations, it's transformation, it's the metamorphosis. <laughs> I'm also, Curious, you were, you were, you're currently working on a book that hasn't the translation hasn't been finished. That has a lot of stories about a polar bear. Um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about sort of shifting not just languages but species. A species, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yes, yeah, um, yeah. The, I'm interested in animals and. And why I like Kafka, he wrote about animals, also machine, because machines and animals are something related to the human being, or they, but not that different to us. So it's an opportunity to see the human being from outside. But it's very difficult to think, thinking about hum, human being or not being the human being. So identifying with uh, animals, it's a sh chance to think about uh, animals. Because I read in the newspaper many articles about Knut, a polar bear in Berlin. That's why I started to write that model. And there were so funny articles. For example, someone wrote that uh, Knut's mother, uh, Tosca, lost her Mother instinct, maternal, in maternal, maternal instinct, because she worked in the socialism in the East Germany, <laughs> <laughs> in the circles. Ne? <laughs> or, <laughs> or the, when Knut died, it was uh, he has uh, some genetic um, problem in the brain, and uh, someone wrote, "Yeah, the nature is not." not human. So the, ma the mother uh, does not accept the children when they are handicapped. And Knut Mutter recognized it, we didn't, but the mother, and that's why she didn't accept Knut. And so, so many theories, and that's all about us, not about animals, I think. About, about our societies, about how human beings uh, understand themselves. <laughs> Did you ever see, get to see Knut? Sorry? Did you ever see Knut, the polar bear? Oh, oh, of course, oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah I guess, yeah. He, lives, he, lived, he lived in Berlin, too. Yeah. Um, yeah. I'm, I'm also curious, your stories have, they have a kind of velocity, they, ha they have a propulsion. You're reading them almost, they do have the sense of a mystery that you're going to learn something. They have that that energy or drive, even if that's not the way they do it, you know, it doesn't end with kind of Hercule Poirot in a room alone t saying something about everyone in the room, but what stands for plot in your books? Because you have the energy and velocity of plots, mm. but you don't have a plot in a conventional no. sense in any way. So how would you characterize sort of what energy or metabolism is that makes your stories move? Because I do feel they have a strong a strong kind of sense of forward motion? In many cases, I had the beginning of the story. I don't know how it continues, but the beginning, it's an image, and it's very intensive, very dense structure of something. And I just start. I write the beginning and, and begin to um, that is like, a, how do you call the cables a lot? That's a big cabel is a lot, you know that? <laughs> a of wires. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and I I don't know <laughs> what is about it. I, I try to work with it and it becomes a line at, from that 
cabe alcanzar. <laughs> There's like an, there's an amazing moment in one of um, my favorite of your stories called The Guest where many things happen in the story, but there's a moment where she's at a flea market and she sees a pair of ice skates and a clock and they present to the narrator as a kind of challenge to, to kind of solve what, what do they have in common. It's almost like a surrealist challenge just in, on her way to the ear doctor. And the solution in that case happens to be that they both move around, but I sort of felt like there's something about that moment that gets at the mechanics of your stories in general. Like what is it about those kinds of associations that mm -hmm. feels important to you? Yeah. It's like you are going into the city and you, you cannot read the letter. You cannot read the information. So you suddenly begin to read the city as a text and you, that you cannot understand. And you see the signs and you, the interpretation, uh, interpretation of the city becomes a text. I, I think you write sometimes oh, uh, also in this the way. The same sickness, the same yeah. as Knut, the same <laughs> like brain. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so the irritability is of course a social problem, but for me it's a chance. Forget the letters, forget the letters as a transport, um, something that transports just information, but you just observe the things you see um, um, sometimes you had the feeling it can mean something, that this image, or, or something that you find on the street. Maybe it's nothing, but you, if your brain begins to read the city, the text is coming to you. Um, do you feel there's something particular, especially given um, the audience this evening, very particular about the German language that allows you to think in a particular <laughs> way, even though for you a, it seems like a huge part of what's beneficial about writing in German is that the letters become a bit opaque and they kind of separate out from the words, but is there something specific about German that you've become attached to or interested in? Yeah, right. one thing that I really like by German language, it's very difficult to pronounce some consonants. For example, you can, in English, you can say just upper, you know, upper. But you must say in German, apfel. <laughs> That's P and, uh, P, uh, P and F. Yeah, it's, it's uh, I need more energy to say it. <laughs> and, and so uh, you, you become aware of that you need your body to, to make language and to also to write my language. It's, I, I, I need all my energies to write, to, to say P, yeah? P, F, yeah. And it's a, the, for the linguist, it's a, in the history, the German, German language changed from the English language, that's a, die zweite Lautverschiebung, yeah? It's a, in the history of the linguistic. So I, I wrote a much Jacob Grimm in the last time, and I, I wrote a text about it, and it's some sentence I want to read it about that. Mir fiel es noch nie leicht, das Wort Apfel auszusprechen. Besonders der Doppelkonsonant PF kostet mich so viel Kraft und Aufmerksamkeit. Warum heißt es nicht einfach Apfel? Seit unzähligen Generationen hielten die deutsch sprechenden Lippen immer wieder die anstrengende PF-Spannung. Die höhere Kunst besteht darin, die Spannung innerhalb von Millisekunden aufzubauen und sofort wieder halb loszulassen. Man muss eine kleine Explosion zulassen, ohne die Kontrolle über sie zu verlieren. Wer braucht aber solche Kunstfertigkeit, außer jemanden, der Trompete spielen will? Jakob sagte, die Lautverschiebung habe eine tiefe innere Befriedigung gebracht. Das war, dann war sie eine sinnliche Angelegenheit, sagte ich. Nein, erwiderte er, es ging um eine nationale Angelegenheit. Vor Schreck ließ ich meinen Apfel aus der Hand fallen und somit auch der Doppelkonsonant PF. Aus dem zerplatzten, zerplatzten Fruchtfleisch wuchs eine neue Pflanze wie ein Pfahl hoch. Die sprießende Kraft des Frühlings steckte im pH der Pflanzen. Die deutsche Sprache war voller Pfefferlinge.
<lacht> Jakob saß auf einem Pferd, das nicht mehr zu zügeln war. Stürzt es in den Abgrund des Nationalstolzes? Über der saftig grünen Landschaft sah ich den Himmel, der gerade seine Abendhaube angezogen hatte. Wo war die Hochsprache zu Hause? In einer Höhe, jedoch nicht im Himmel. Gott stand fünf Buchstaben hinter Bibelübersetzung. Und am Anfang war der Buchstabe A. So, that's, that, you know, the German language seemed to me somehow the concentration of the power in some point. And that makes me, um, yeah, that, give, maybe that gives me an energy. <laughs> How did you find the German language when you stayed in Berlin for well, some weeks? For example, what you just read, yeah. I heard, I don't know if these words are really in there, I heard Saftig and Gott. So I thought, I thought she's talking about a chubby God special to German. That's all I caught. Um, um, I'm also curious when now, after Japanese became somewhat estranged to you over yeah. enough years, and after you'd been away long enough, what was it that began to pop for you or be distinctive about the Japanese language? Um, in Japanese language, we have we don't have so much consonant, you know? <laughs> and, and we have also many onomatopoe onomatopoeses, yeah. And we don't need subject in the sentence, you know? We don't have the, really have the subject in the grammar and instead of subject, the topic, and that's why we don't, one example is t when you want to uh, say, I love you, yeah? ich liebe dich. It's uh, in Japanese, watashi wa anata ga suki desu. And when you, yeah. Uh, a lot of work. Yes, yeah, <laughs> yeah. And when you translate it into German, it, um, it says, was mich betrifft, bist du begehrenswürdig. <laughs> and, and so, can you uh, translate it into English? Uh. I, for my part, you are desirable. <laughs> I think that's very polite. It's sort of not making a, it's not being too general or bombastic about your perspective. Yeah, yeah, but may maybe too polite. So the, the <laughs> you can say, oh, I'm desirable, thank you, bye. <laughs> um, I'm also curious when you read or what you read for, do you find that you read literature proper? It seems like for you just sort of a bus advertisement might be as almost as nourishing as a story. I'm just kind of curious what kind of things you're hungry to read for when you're working on something. Or what, what ends up being an interesting text for you? Because I often find, actually, strangely enough, that fiction writers read less fiction as if, like, fiction is not the food for fiction. There's some other food oh. for fiction. I don't know what that might be for you. What's your answer? I, 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 I'm, I'm old-fashioned. I like to read fiction. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Hmm. But once you began to write something, you are in the process of becoming something. It's not my, I, I don't uh, need food, but the text maybe, the text itself wants to become something and it, it is moving and I just, I just play with. You mean when you're writing, you're yeah. just following the sen you're following the sentences. One yeah, thing yeah, generates yeah, another. Yeah. So when you're when you're working on something, how much? How, when when do you are you able to move forward? Is it is it is it that you kind of have an idea of the next scene? I don't get the sense that that's the way you work. What is it that kind of moves you forward from one sentence into the next ah. sentence? 
That's a good question. Uh, like if I, uh, yeah. like if I What's was What's your guessing. answer? No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not giving anything. So you are right. Uh. I'm not giving anything. <laughs> no, I, just, I just have an intuition that the way that you work, I don't get the sense that you sort of write a draft, throw out the second half, and decide why mm. isn't it in Ecuador instead of here. Mm. Like I think I get the sense that you have a sentence, and it, once the first sentence is there, I'm mm. guessing, I'm just curious, once the first sentence is there, it's, it's finished. Mm. And that it like kind of starts to determine the next work. I'm just kind of curious about the mm. process because it seems like you do a lot of work to estrange yourself from the text. That mm. seems like an important part of your process. Yeah. So I'm curious, yeah. you know, because I know people are often curious, like how how the text generates itself, how your stories move forward. Or we could move on to Bruno Schultz. Mm. We could go back <laughs> yeah, to yeah. the beginning. Yeah, yeah. I was very surprised that you mentioned Bruno Schultz in the in your essay because I had never told anybody that I love Bruno Schultz. So how did you do know that? Well, I, I'm curious why you love him because the thing about him that I find similar to you is something I feel I haven't really developed the language to describe. But the logic of his stories mm -hmm. seems. Uh, you know, I guess the like, for lack of a better term, like I would start with something about dream logic, that it seems it has yeah. a kind of image. It seems on the one hand, you can't escape the rule of the story. The story is, is very certain. There's not another way out. Mm -hmm. and, yet mm -hmm. and yet it's not, um, it's a bit of a dream logic. Yeah. That's, that's what I see that, yeah. that you yeah. have in yeah. common. But I'm curious yeah. what you like about Bruno Schultz or what you identify yeah. in his stories that's of interest to you? It's very difficult to talk about Bruno Schultz because it's ni nothing concrete to me that I can talk about, but it's something like a strong atmosphere or come to me like a, an atmosphere. It's dense atmosphere and it's all emotions are in it, but you don't know which one. It's not just happy or sad. Or that's everything is at the same time in, in it. And, and it's, I also like the, like of course Kafka and Paul Celan, and they all they are all Jewish writers who are not in the center. Uh, they they had not lived in in the middle of Germany. I don't know where the middle of Germany is. But not in <laughs> not in Germany. Yeah, <laughs> but outside, it's the 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 kind of out periphery. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. Uh, right. Yeah, and the figure of the father is very important. But I don't know. How do you read <laughs> that father? Or Bruno Schultz? I don't know. I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> but it, for me, it was more the connection seemed more. Another thing is that, like, um, inanimate objects in Bruno Schultz and, and nature uh, all on a spectrum seem as kind of alive and sort of full of meaning and emotion and something to read as the people. I mean, I think, in fact, one of the kind of. Um, standout scenes in, in Bruno Schultz is where he catches his father at night kind of hang, almost hanging out with, for lack of a better term, hanging out with the mannequins. They're yeah. just as real as everybody else. And that is something also that connects him, in my mind, to your stories, that kind of there's not a, there, there's no sense that kind of, you know, what we're saying here is somehow more alive or potent or worth reading than, you know, a, a weirdly like whatever it might be, just kind of the leaves blowing or the sound of the cars going by. Everything sort of seems to be trembling yeah, and ready yeah, to be read. Yeah. That's kind of what reminds yeah. me, that's something about what reminds me in your, in your work as well. I kind of am curious, have you ever sort of run the counterfactual of what kind of writer you would be if you hadn't moved to Germany? Oh, <laughs> yeah, um, I don't know, I don't know. But, but sure, I, I maybe I had um, looked the another language inside Japan, for example, ancient language and old language, or street language, or the language of minority. But I'm sure that I looked for something 
other another language, not a really foreign language, but something that is exists in Japan. And you chose to study German language and literature. What do you do? You have a sense of what drew you to that in particular? Was it somewhat chance, or, or was there a particular set of writers, or something that drew you to German language and literature in particular? Um, I. Uh, when I moved to Germany, from to me, is a, the, yes, I I love I love many la, uh, writers, Bruno Schulz, of course, but also Kafka and um, many writers in Europe. It's not just Germany, but I said I thought I I want to go to Europe to see uh, not only reading the literature, but I I um, wanted to see how people handle with that language or the how. They live with the language, in, not just in the literature, but how the language is used and felt. And I want to see it. That's why I moved to moved them. And and then I visited the University of Hamburg. And I I had I did I didn't want to study. I I studied in Japan and got a lit, uh, BA in literature. It was enough. So yeah, quit. <laughs> yeah, the the um. Humanity is enough. I want to write. I want to see real, real people, real life, and 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 write. But then I visited. Uh, it happened to me to visit the uh, University of Hamburg, and it was so interesting there. It's not really a university. It's just cafes and spaces where people are s were sitting and discussing about literature and poems. I really loved it, and that's why I decided to study. Uh, and you don't have to pay, you know? No, not in like this. Just going to the, going there and discuss with the student. And so I came to it, um, yeah, study, study German, uh, German literature. I think before we take um, questions from the audience, Yoko Tawara was so kind as to um, read some of her most recent poetry to us. Uh, yeah. So you had selected maybe two poems to read to us in German. Die zweite Person, ich. Als ich dich noch sitzte, sagte ich ich und meinte damit mich. Seit gestern duze ich dich weiß aber noch nicht, wie ich mich umbenennen soll. <lacht> Und der nächste Poem ist aber der Konsonant CH. Ja? <lacht> so you never, you, you never know if it is ich oder auch. Und, ja? <lacht> Do you remember it? <lacht> Vor einem hellen Vokal gleich werde ich meinen Bauch zeigen und tanzen an einem Teich, wo eine deutsche Eiche steht. Ein gottloses Buch werde ich euch schreiben und steige hoch auf den Galgen. Ich bin ein fliegender Teppich mit einem Kopftuch. So ein Pech. Kann ich fliehen? Kennst du das Land CH? Die Lesart der Heiligen Schriftzeichen C und H bleibt weiter offen. So I think we have time for just a couple of questions about the land of CH or anything else that came up tonight. I just have a question about your reaction to colors when you came to Germany and if you sensed any kind of coding in colors in Germany as there is in Japan that you oh. write about. This is the first time that someone asked me this question. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> the colors. Huh? I, I, um, I mean, there is no color in winter, you know, in Hamburg. <laughs> but, uh, but I had the feeling if you go to the concert or opera and you hear the music or you hear also the German language, in the singing. So I saw the color in my brain. It's very colorful language for me. It's not the color of something concrete, the flower or, or fruits, but it's uh, in the language itself. It's so 
colorful. So I, once I wrote, um, Deutsche Sprache is bunt, yeah? and someone asked me, do you really mean it? Or I, I really mean it, yeah. You're writing a book on a polar bear. I was wondering if you could share with us any discoveries you'd made about polar... Uh, uh, discoveries I made about four of them. There are many, many discoveries I made. I can't tell you. But I, I hope that um, uh, Susan Bernowski translates this book and New Directions, the people who New Directions are also here, they publish it so you can read it. Or <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe you, you learn German? It's then, uh, or yes. Chinese, there's Chinese uh, translation. <laughs> <laughs> How do you like English? How I like it. Yeah. It's, um, I don't... Uh, uh, go to the English language, but the English language came to me. That means I got invitations to the United States, many invitations. A student came to me with questions. They asked questions in English. So I, I have a lot of beautiful memories about, about English language. It's not the, um, it's, um, Yeah, so I, 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 I had no time to make an opinion about English English uh, language. You know, there are so many questions. I, I <laughs> it's struggle to ask to uh, to answer the questions and to to react um, on English comments and so. Yeah. Your, your relationship with German is so bobbly and so yes, yeah. so. And I'm wondering, really, does the ah. English language? Ah yes, because Ask these uh, questions of you also. Yeah, because I was young when I came to Germany, and I made many very important experience of life with and in German language. So it's something special. It's not one of foreign languages that you learn. And uh, um, and I could make English. Um, um, near to me, or maybe, I, but I'm afraid, you know, when I stay in the United States and talk English every day, I recognize that my German become um, weak. <laughs> it's, it's a, they are very similar to me, English and German. When I run real English, maybe I cannot write in German. So that's why I like the mother of Knut. You know? <laughs> so, so <that. laughs> Where do you consider as your homeland right now? In New York? No, I mean <laughs> the homeland in your <laughs> mind. My, my homeland for my heart. Yes. Yeah, yeah, New York, where I am now. <laughs> Everywhere. <laughs> yeah, I don't have the, the concept or feeling of homeland. I, I can, I, everywhere when I, where I am, when I, re, I, I, can, I meet uh, people who read the same book like me, uh, li love literature like you, Bruno Schultz, so <laughs> I, I feel at home. <laughs> I think that's a perfect uh, moment and thought with which to wrap up our discussion tonight, and I invite you to continue um, the conversation about home, about language, and about the world with our two amazing authors, Yoko Tawada and Rivka Galchin, over a glass of wine. Thanks for coming tonight. Thank you.